Hayo Aiken from the University of Alaska Fairbanks. I think he is the acting director of IARC, I, IARC and he is well respected as a polar oceans ice expert. So Hayo, please, uh, please help me welcome Hayo. Thank you, Fran. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. Um, I just wanted to highlight a few of the things that were already brought up by the speakers before me on the panel using more specific illustrations of, of some of the points that were made, in particular with respect to, and this actually is, is a nice view of the sea ice uh, out in Barrow a couple of years ago in the early spring, using illustrations of, of sea ice, which I, I still uh, feel is one of the great places of instruction. I'm certainly still an undergraduate at CS College following uh, Reggie Jewell's comments this morning. Um, so here's, here's a view of um, observations in the U.S. Arctic, in U.S. Arctic waters. Uh, this is for a specific year, 2011-12. Uh, what we did was just try to get an idea of what, what is it actually that we're talking about if we're talking about observations and, and, and part of them sustained observations. So for this year, we looked at who is actually compiling or making some of these observations? And it's instructive, I think, to reflect on this because it relates to some of the points that were made here earlier. So about a third of these observations are made by universities, academia, uh, about one-fifth each by the federal government, by the state government, uh, sorry, by, by industry and the private sector, and foreign organizations. And foreign organizations, I, I would like to institute, um, in particular, uh, efforts by Japan, uh, South Korea, China, um, this number may even be higher uh, in part because of, because of reporting challenges. And then we also have those somewhat smaller, if you look at the number of projects or number of observations, very important local government tribal organizations and, and the state government. Um, so you look at this and some people who are coming at this from the perspective of let's design a you know, a, a well-defined, scientifically structured and, and uh, justified observing system might look at this and say, well, this is just a patchwork of stuff that's being done, right? Um, what, what I'd like to, to, to sort of throw out to you to consider is that this is the way Arctic observing happens. There's nothing we can do about it, and maybe it's a good thing because it's a collaborative effort. A lot of it is bottom up. You have an important role played by university organizations, academia, um, but also, as, as Jimmy Stotts mentioned, a lot of the sustained observations are made in villages and communities informally, but in many ways contribute greatly to, to the overall availability of information. Why is that important? Number of issues. This morning, some of you might have been in the emergency preparedness response session. Um, I would pose that as you respond to emergencies in this area, as everybody is well aware, a lot of the first responders will be based out of villages, they will rely on information that's available through these types of observing net networks. So you're going to have to find ways in which this type of information can be leveraged and built on in the case of rapid response. The, uh, the DHS Center of Excellence here in Anchorage that is, is actually helping with that is going to be an important part of, of this type of effort, but so will be other nations. You know, this, this morning the example that was brought by uh, Admiral Abel was, you know, rescue of somebody on a Korean research vessel. That Korean research vessel was putting buoys in U.S. waters that are improving our weather forecasts as well as weather forecasts and, and forecasts of extreme events in Eastern Asia. And it's that type of collaboration and linkage that, that we want to build on the Arctic because we're good at it and we're good at it even at times where there may be larger scale global consideration that may make collaboration outside of the Arctic more difficult. Um, so, so you can think of this sort of, you know, as, as, as an academic, of course, we like to make uh, diagrams that are near unintelligible. Um, this is a good example, um, but, but it, it illustrates the, the challenge that Dr. Sullivan already alluded to as well, is that if you want to produce actionable data, information that can inform decisions, you oftentimes think about this from the perspective of a desired outcome by a stakeholder. And if, if I talk to my research colleagues, if, if, if I'm telling them, hey, we have to make sure that the data that we're collecting within academia are dual purpose, that they both help us understand the Arctic system better, but that they also serve desirable outcomes from the stakeholder perspective. As soon as you say desirable to a geophysicist or, or a physical oceanographer, it's like, whoa, you know, don't, don't, don't talk, talk to me about desires in the context of my research. 
But it is this question of how do you link these two different worlds of observing that, that is part of the challenge. And it may be just as important, and I think we've heard that implicitly from some of the panel members here, may be just as important to put resources into improving the information flow and the communication across these different uh, perspectives on the Arctic environment. One way to do that is, and I, I think actually Jimmy Stotts described a great example, communities of practice, informal collaborations where, such as in Barrow, where I've learned a lot about the CIs from people like Kenneth Tuva, who worked early on with, with NARL. Um, the, these types of informal collaborations that, that build themselves from the ground up, those are ways to deal with both the, the opportunities we have for collaboration, but also the, the fact that the increased activity and the rapid Arctic change demand collaboration. And, and the challenge is that building good communities of practice is as much a question of resources as it is of, of kind of the social science and the informal ways of getting at this. So how do we do this? I just want to illustrate one quick example, again, using my favorite material on Earth, sea ice. One way is to think about it not so much compartmentalized, and of course, a lot of people are not news, but thinking about it, what services do we gain from the ice cover? And people often forget that even the lower 48 or outside um, climate regulation by the sea ice cover is a very important factor. There's a lot of federal agencies who are studying this, but thinking about it in the context of services is an important part. Same is true for climate regulation. Uh, or, or coastal protection, the role of CS in supporting subsistence activities. Again, we've heard from Mike Brubaker about this. And also in the context of, of hazards, where of course uh, sea ice plays an important role. Are there ways to, to build communities of practice? Again, I, I would argue that one example uh, is the, uh, the CS Prediction Network, or SIPIN, that's brought together different experts from different communities and different backgrounds. Uh, I encourage you to look at the, the Arctic Sea Ice Outlook as one product of that group. But this also includes collaboration such as flight lines from NASA flights, industry and, and uh, National Science Foundation supported research that is being evaluated here from the perspective of data quality, again, something that Dr. Sullivan was getting at. But it also involves people like Joe Levitt up in Barrow who shared observations and made regular observations as part of, of a CS observing network trying to find ways in which you can link all of these things together in, in, in a single context, that's a big challenge. And I would argue that we need to be sure that we have both resources, but also the time and the, the, uh, the, the help in, in bridging some of these the communication gaps that we may encounter. Again, co-production of knowledge, um, Jimmy Stotts already alluded at that. Co-management of data is a very important aspect of this. And, and what you see here, these, these co-management approaches, those are some of the, the low-hanging fruit that I would argue we need to focus on in, in observing networks. Thank you. Thank you, Hayo. I wish we had another hour to dig deeper into all of this, but we don't. I think we have time for two quick questions before we adjourn upstairs. So uh, if the microphone, there we go, in the back, right there. Thank you. Thanks very much. Great stuff. Um, I'm Jim Gamble with Allied International Association. We're also involved in some fairly extensive community-based monitoring efforts, and we're also involved with SEON. And so one of the things that we struggle with is trying to bridge those two things. So in other words, this is data we're developing on the ground. How do we make it interoperable at the SEON level, this overarching Arctic observing uh, network? Um, and that there's a lot of factors there. I realize it's a, it's a broad question, but Metadata, interoperability, how does, I, I'm just curious how the panel sees bridging this huge overarching uh, network like SEON with information developed on the ground by communities themselves. One person can answer it. Who wants to? Hiya, go I for may. it. Uh, it it's, it's, a, it's a great question, a, a big challenge. You have to take it step by step. One way is uh, part of the SEON sponsor activity jointly with International Arctic Science uh, Committee is the so-called Arctic Science Summit Week and the Arctic Observing Summit. Next year in March, uh, March 12th through 18, it'll be in Fairbanks. And in fact, but, but you know, good, good opportunity to plug, but there's two groups, or actually three groups, that are part of the Observing Summit that are trying to get at this at a tractable level. One 
co-chaired by the World Ocean Council and a consortium from Canada compiling remote sensing data, looking at developing protocols and interoperability standards for platforms of opportunity by industry. So this involves oil and gas industry, shipping industry, and others. The, the great thing about that summit is that at the same time, there's a group co-led by uh, Rochelle Daniel here from, from, uh, from Alaska, Lena Kielsen-Holm from Greenland, and um, uh, Robert Way from Canada, uh, from Nunavik, who's looking at this question of uh, traditional knowledge, indigenous knowledge, community-based observing. And, and that summit, because it is a summit where you bring together people who already chew through the problems through white papers and other, other things in advance, uh, is going to be a great opportunity to at least see wh where can we make progress in the international context. And this includes other countries uh, outside of the Arctic as well.